my faith drives my purpose. It dictates why I even exist. It drives really um, what I care about in life and what, what matters most. And then everything gets filtered through that purpose. I run a business every day. And so I have to deal with risk. There's no way to not have risk. And so I, I pursue things outside of business where I can enjoy it, but I can also develop a healthy relationship with risk not be too afraid of it, but also not be arrogant. But what I realized as I started diving more and had opportunities to get into more technical things and then flying, again, flying, it's just beautiful up there. Um, but there's also risk. What I found was in life, I didn't have a really healthy relationship with risk. I've learned more and more when to just go, no, it's not happening today. I'm not doing this. This is this is not the right day. And, and I've walked away from dives and from fly, flights because of that at times. I guess another part for me when it comes back to that purpose is the, the little thing which is a big thing. It's just constantly going back to center, to staying, making sure I'm staying centered on on what my priorities are. I think one of the core is a sense sort of a visionary a tone of what we why we're here. That we're here for a purpose that's beyond us. Um, it's it's really easy especially for kids to but all of us really to get locked in a very egocentric, the world is about me. How do you handle the complex circumstances of your life? How do you make it simple? My guest today is James Riley, and I was so impressed with his ability to simplify complex and sometimes dangerous situations in his life by having a very clearly defined purpose and very clearly prioritizing those purposes to help him make guided, informative, and important decisions that sometimes mean the difference between life and death. I hope you enjoy my conversation today with James Riley. James, um, not that long ago, you found yourself doing some soul searching. Can you tell me about what led you into that soul searching process and maybe what are some things that you learned? Um, a lot of the things I do, I mean, I run a business every day and so I have to deal with risk. There's no way to not have risk. And so um, I, I pursue things outside of business where uh, I can enjoy it, but I can also um, develop a healthy relationship with risk, not be too afraid of it, but also not be arrogant. And I was faced with that pretty, pretty keenly uh, in April. I was on a dive trip. Um, we're diving under ice packing caves up in Norway and a friend of mine died. Um, oh my gosh. And we actually pulled him out of the water and the whole thing. And it, really was an opportunity for all of us, me especially, to really reflect what am I doing? Why am I doing it? Um, am I making good risk choices? And um, am I, do I have the right contingencies or the right, do I have the right mentality around saying no uh, and being able to say, hey, I'm not going to do this. Um, and when I am saying yes, am I saying yes for the right reasons? Uh, and really just taking the time to reflect on that and say, what am I really doing here and what, what matters most and how am I making sure that my actions are aligning with what really matters most? Wow. Um, I'm, I think you probably just cracked open several fears that a lot of people have <laughs> being in the, in the ocean, diving under ice, losing someone close to you. Yeah. I would, I would love it if you could paint the picture of that dive. What was the planning and preparation? Who was this friend? And walk us through that day of the dive and, you know, what went wrong. And then I, then I do want to hear the follow-up of where that led you in that soul search. Yeah. Um, so, and this isn't at all to brag, but the kind of diving we're doing, that's sort of like Mount Everest type diving. This is um, the elite of the elite people that are doing this kind of thing. And some days I look and go, man, I don't know that I'm really qualified to sit in that group. Um, but then I 
show up and I guess I sort of am. Um, but yeah, so this is the, the water is barely above freezing. You have to chip through ice to get in it. And then and cave diving is difficult in and of itself. And then ultra cold water on top of that. And then we're diving on rebreathers. Um, so, you know, layers upon layers of things that, that are very good tools. You know, rebreathers are a phenomenal tool for what we do. And we have heated undergarments and dry suits and other things. But um, we have really good tools, but you still have to have good risk management. And so we as a group, it was a group of nine of us, we went on this trip. And it's really um, a few of the people there had already done this trip. Um, and um, it's really sort of a monumental once in a lifetime type thing. It's um, pretty extreme. And we weren't necessarily doing it to fight, to chase the extremes, but to just go see some, you know, the Star Trek boldly go where no one has gone before. It's to see some places that um, are, are unseen by almost a, a very, all but a very, very small group of people. And um, so we did a lot of planning about what kind of gases are we going to use? What kind of equipment do we have? Um, how are we going to work as teams? Um, making sure that we were ready to go dive, that kind of thing. A um, lot of planning, a lot of conversations before we ever went on the trip, while we were traveling even more. And then as we got there, um, really making sure that we were really had everything buttoned down. And actually the dive where he died was actually our shakedown dive. It was just sort of the make sure everything's working okay. Um, wow. Uh, yeah. What what went wrong? Um, he ended up having, as best we understand, we're still waiting on autopsy and that all those investigations take a while. Um, there's no concern of foul play or anything. Um, and there's really not any concern, although they're investigating it to be sure, there's not really a concern of equipment malfunction. Um, he had a history of um, having, he one other time he'd had seizure, just a mm -hmm. sort of an unrelated, he got really dehydrated and sort of sick. Uh, what we didn't know going into the trick was that he was, um, he had been sick and was very dehydrated. Um, and the best, the best sort of we can figure right now is that, um, that we got back in the cave and that led to essentially a seizure. Um, but when you're 20 minutes back in a cave underwater, that doesn't, that doesn't work out well. How did the group recognize that something was wrong with this diver? I'm, I'm not a diver. So all of this is new to me, but I, I assume that you had, he had a buddy or, you know, you're watching out for each other, but how quickly did someone recognize that there was a problem? So actually I was on the surface when it happened. I'd done a dive earlier in the morning with another group and we our shakedown. And then there was a group of three, him and two others that went in. And um, when you're, in, when you're in the cave, there's no light. So you have a light and a, a way to signal that you have distress is to sort of flash it back and forth. Uh, and so when you see that, you turn around and go, what's going on? Um, my one, one of my friends, well, actually all three of them are friends, but one of them was in the lead and the gal was in second. And then uh, the guy who died was in third, um, the gal in second, her primary light failed. And we always have backups and backups for our backups. Cause you do that as we do in aviation too. And, um, her light failed, her primary light failed. So she switched to her backup, which was not a big deal. She signaled the guy in front to say, hey, my, my primary light failed. And, and he did what is normal. The minute somebody has a failure, you put that person number one in the group and you let them set the pace of exiting the cave. It wasn't an emergency. We have backups for backups. Somebody else could have handed her another backup if there was an issue. But we say, hey, we're headed out of the cave now and we're going to put you number one. As he was doing that, he saw Jared in the back behind that and um and saw jared's light go erratic and jared went upright um and that's and so he, it was witnessed in that way um in cave a lot of times we're in a line and there could have been a chance that it wouldn't have been witnessed um but in this case it most incidents aren't witnessed in this case it was um so uh, my friend sent 
the gal ahead um, and said, go. <laughs> and then my friend ended up pulling him, pulling Jared out of the water or dragging him the 20 minute swim they did in very fast <laughs> um, and got him out. And we had already, because we'd been alerted, we had EMS on the way. We had ADs and O2 and pulled them out, doing everything we could. But it wasn't enough. Oh. I can only imagine what kind of thoughts were going through your mind at, at that time. Uh, certainly the loss of a friend or, or, or a companion in any way, somebody that you've shared this kind of experience with um, hits really deeply. So tell me what were some of the, what are some of the thoughts that you've been working for? Cause this is really fresh. This is only a few months old. And so I imagine that process continues. You haven't gone full cycle with that, I'm sure. But what, what are some of the things that, that you've been confronting? I think in the moment I was sort of, I don't know that I would say emotionally shut down, but sort of, so it was more focused on the actions and um, we had the rest of our group was actually, it, what, what was amazing was when, when Lauren got out um, or got to the surface, there were other divers that were prepping to go on a dive. The rest of our group was prepping to go do their shakedown. Dive. And so there were divers in the water ready to go. So one of those divers took off to go down and meet my friend who was pulling out Jared. Um, and so it was amazing that there was that support just sort of happened to be available. Um, but as we pulled Jared out, we're working on him. We're dealing with other divers that are sitting in the water in near freezing water. So there's just sort of the logistics of making sure that we're doing what we can in the response, making sure that we're executing an res emergency response plan to get EMS back there. Um, thinking about the other divers, um, my friend who drug Jared out um, was really, really close to having problems himself. And so it was keeping an eye on him, making sure that he was just, his heart rate was spiked. He was at maximal workload. Um, so making sure he was, he was taking care of himself to recover, but it, just, you know, me on the surface, I didn't have, I was more, I had a sort of a good overview of what was going on. And so it was keeping an eye on him of uh, making sure things were okay. And, um, uh, so sort of, there's a lot of different things happening at once. And for me, it was more being able to see it from a high level. Um, and didn't, at that point, didn't really emotionally connect with it a lot. Um, and, um, and then we, as a group afterwards, we, we all spent quite a bit of time together and talked and debriefed and, um, dialogued and talked about what if scenarios and different things. And, um, so we did a lot of sort of technical debrief to make, because pretty advanced divers. We understood that part to really get a grasp on what had happened and then shared some of our emotions and our fears and our concerns together as a group. Um, and um, yeah, it just, for me, then it sort of led into some introspection of why am I doing this? And, and just, just, it's a good thing in general to prompt if we're doing things to make sure that we're really aligning with our purpose. Um, whatever it is, whether it's spending money or spending time or not doing that or whatever it is, um, that, that it's worth it, that the cost is cost justified. Um, and obviously the diving and even flying is, um, there's a risk to it. And so then the question is, is, is it worth it? And do I have, am I in the right place emotionally to say, no, I'm not going to do this today. No, this isn't going to happen. Um, and to know how to set and define and maintain those boundaries. Um, so there's a good chance, there's a good opportunity for me to reflect and just say, why am I doing this in the first place? Should I consider abandoning it and not do it ever again? Or do I really have a good reason and am I making sure I'm staying centered and aligned with that reasoning? That actually, I think, is an excellent question that came to my mind is you have two what most people in the world would consider high risk hobbies, right? Um, and at both extremes of the atmosphere, you're yeah. deep diving or, or you're in dives where, you know, most people are not qualified and it would terrify them to do so. Um, 
And then also flying is also a huge fear for some people, and you're doing both. In your reflections, have you ever thought about why you're drawn to those hobbies? Um, is yeah, I'll just leave it with that. What what draws you to that, and why? What purpose do you think that fills for you? It's, it's a good question. Um, I got into diving entry level just because sort of stumbled onto a resort dive course and fell in love with it, said I want to do that more. But what I realized as I started diving more and had opportunities to get into more technical things and then flying, um, again, flying, it's just beautiful up there. Um, but there's also risk. But what I found was in life, I didn't have a really healthy relationship with risk. Um, I was either too arrogant about it. I said, ah, it never happened to me. Let's go ahead and fly and we talk about dangerous attitudes. And I had some of that, right? It, um, no big deal. Or I just couldn't quantify the risk. And so I just said, well, I'll just abandon it and not do it or I will. And it was, it was sort of this all or nothing. Um, and I, that's a risk in and of itself. Um, and I, I realized that in business and life, I needed to be able to stare at, quantify, understand, and make healthy risk decisions, uh, whether that's an investment in the business or, you know, saying, hey, we're going to, quote unquote, gamble that this thing's going to pay off. Um, and how do you do that? Um, and, and what you know in investing is that it's, it's not a gamble, right? It's a calculated decision and um, you have contingency options. And it's interesting because scuba, the, the, Cave diving I do is technically the most, the second most dangerous sport in the world next to base jumping. Um, <laughs> base jumping scares me because you have no contingencies. If the chute doesn't open, you have no contingencies. When we do diving, we, we don't just plan the dive. We're planning for contingencies and then contingencies of our contingencies. Uh, when we're flying, you know, we have, uh, you, know, you have your FAA rules about reserve fuel. Well, I have an added margin. I always want an amount of fuel left in the plane. So I'm always thinking about where would I go if I land. You know, one of the one of my angel flight flights um, came back from El Paso at night. I flew along I-10 mm -hmm. back to Tucson uh, instead of flying more direct over the mountains because I was in a single engine plane. I just said, hey, my bailout is to go land on I-10 and enough lights down there i can see it um so what i like in the areas is not just i mean it's sort of the obvious it's beautiful it's there's a there's a sense of exploration um but there's also a sense of being able to look at quantify assess and then build mitigation plans around the different risks and sometimes the mitigation plan is to not fly or to not dive and and um I've learned more and more when to just go, no, nope, it's not happening today. I'm not doing this. This is, this is not the right day. Um, and, and I've walked away from dives and from fly, flights because of that at times. James, were there, did these hobbies develop later in your life or was this early onset uh, <laughs> attraction to this high risk activity? Uh, later, later in life, uh, the, the flying definitely, I've had an attraction to it since I was a kid. Um, but I don't know that I really understood why, I, why I desired to learn it. Um, but I have a bad, my right eye is bad. Um, and so I had always been told I wouldn't be able to fly. So I had to go through about nine months of getting an FAA waiver and going through a medical flight test and other things. Um, and again, sort of that risk management. I really embrace it. Said, "Hey, if I'm not safe to fly, I don't want to fly. That's not right." And um, went up with a few instructor pilots early on and said, "I want you to test out my vision and tell me if you think that that I've got what I'm going to need to have to make this happen, or am I unsafe and this is not okay?" Um, so, yeah, it, it's always been a passion, but flying, especially, I stayed away from it for that. Um, Diving, really, I didn't know about it until uh, 12 years ago and really just sort of stumbled on it and fell in love then. James, you have a family. How do they feel about your diving and your flying? Um, 
all but one of my my wife is a technical diver. She she's been in caves, but not okay. not nearly doing what I'm doing. And uh, three of my four daughters are divers as well. Um, they are not technical divers or anything like that. Um, and and they have a little bit of trepidation, but they um, they also understand that it's it's part of what makes me tick in life. And um, they see a lot of the frameworks I developed there um, in diving and in flying. Um, they see a lot of how those apply back into the way that, uh, that I am at home, um, just as a person and in the business. And, and same with flying. They've all been up flying with me. They all enjoy going flying with me. Um, some, some of them are more nerdy about the technical aspects of it than others. <laughs> Um, but, uh, they've all enjoyed going flying and, uh, and, and even watching sort of the risk management choices about, we've had times where I go, Hey, we're not flying today. The weather's not right. Or uh, I don't feel comfortable with what it's going to be when we come home or something like that. So. Have you always had that clear guidelines or have there been experiences where maybe you took more risk than you should have? And then you learned from that, and that's what informed how you manage risk now. Uh, really, the, the not clear guidelines, and, and it's um, I've done a lot of studying of different sort of risk management techniques um, in diving. There's a guy um, Gareth Locke that's written a book called Human Factors that has some really good stuff. And when I teach technical diving, it's mandatory reading for my students. Um, and one of the mm -hmm. things he talks about there. There's a lot of different frameworks, whether it's the Dunning-Kruger effect of, of how much we're really aware of and how much we are sort of unconscious that it even exists. Um, so I've always been, I've always tried to be very intentional about risk and risk management. Um, but I think that a lot of times I've been ignorant of where the risk existed. Um, and so then you, you bump off of that. And you say, okay, what can I learn from this? What can I learn from this event? And is this something I should have had in my framework to consider or be aware of? Um, and yeah, I mean, at some point in time, you are pushing boundaries. And so there's, um, it's, it's always sort of that space of, did I push a little bit too far? Did I not push enough? Um, and trying to balance that, that balance um, and not go too far. I've had a few especially early on, I had a few crosswind landings that I go, man, <laughs> a little closer to the edge <laughs> than I should have been where I was. Uh, yeah, now they're more fun, but then it was just, um, and, and I had a few that were, you know, rougher, and I said, wait, I need to back off and set different minimums and then work back up on my skill because that one pushed my boundary a little too hard or I need to be more ready to do a go around. Has, has there been a time either in the airplane or in the water where you recognized, wow, I'm in over my head here and where it became scary? Um, I felt like that uh, my first solo flight. I think most everybody that flies remembers <laughs> their first, their solo. Uh, I once the plane lifted off the ground, realizing the only person that's going to get this thing back on the ground is me. Um, and, uh, <laughs> It really sort of had to repeat and say, okay, my instructor said what it takes, you know, set aside your ego and be willing to do a go around if anything looks wrong. And, um, yeah. So, um, and then I was in an untowered airport that turns into the wild west and, um, I ended up doing a go around. I think it was my second landing. Um, I ended up doing a go around just because airplanes were cutting people off and doing other stuff. And I just said, nope not going to do this. Um, so yeah, I, I sort of within reason, I like finding those spaces because it forces me to slow down, calm, calm the panic response down, uh, and then go back to the fundamentals of what, you know, and yeah, I've had that in diving too. I've had some dives that really push boundaries and I said, wait, I, I'm not sure what it takes to do this. Um, and then you just have to go back to fundamentals and say, okay, what are, what are my escape plans? What are my contingencies and, and rest on those kinds of things um, and set aside our ego um, and say, I'm, I'm willing to, to, to admit that I pushed it too hard or 
um, and learn from it. How does your faith interact with your view of risk and how to manage risk? Um, it really, my faith drives my purpose. Um, so um, it dictates why I even exist. It drives really um, what I care about in life and what, what matters most. Um, and then everything gets filtered through that purpose is um, if something doesn't align or further or support living and fulfilling that purpose, then, um, then it, at a minimum, it goes way down on the list, if not just completely eradicated. How would you articulate that purpose, James? My first purpose for me is to serve God, to bring glory to his name. And that's above my family. It's above the business. It's above any of these other ventures. Um, it really is that in my life. And I think all these other things are outlets in, in being able to, to do that. But, um, but that's my first purpose is to serve God and to bring glory to him. I have found uh, so much strength in flying as um, a confirmation of my personal faith. Um, it's, you can't capture with a camera, you can't describe in words, the sunrise as, you know, over the desert or the sunset over the coast as I'm flying in San Diego. Um, there's just no way to do it. A camera can't capture it. Words can't describe it. Um, wow. we try, right? My, I, I can't remember what we were doing now. I, I do. I, we were looking through the pictures in my phone. Uh, because I have once a month I go through and I, I try and journal what, what went right this last month, what were some challenges and I'll do that. I'll go through the pictures in my phone and I was having my wife help me. And because I, I do real estate investing and I fly, her words were airplane, 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 house, 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 airplane, airplane, airplane. <laughs> um, what are some of the best moments you've had either in the water or in the air? As you mentioned sunsets, um, one of them was, uh, it's a local group here in Tucson called Right Flight. Um, and I had uh, two two girls that I was taking up that had earned basically discovery flights. They're about 25, 30 minute flights. Um, and we were getting later in the day and the sun was getting pretty low angle. Sky was starting to turn colors. And uh, we took off and we're out on our second flight. Um, so we fly one, land, switch kids, and who's in the front seat, and then go again. And um, and the sun got really low, and the the sky started turning really just just the beautiful colors. Um, and I saw it, and it was beautiful to me. And then I looked over, and I saw the faces of the girls, and it just, yeah, I the, there's there's no words to say it to like you just said, um, but that's that's probably one of the. I remember coming back from that and going, this is probably one of my best flights ever. Um, just, just because I got to see it through their eyes and they got to see it and light up. And um, since then, I've been able to see that in other people's eyes and being able to share that and deliver that experience to them has been pretty powerful. Um, the, the best I can equate what you're talking about is um, when we were pregnant with our daughters, my wife had really complicated pregnancies and we had to do ultrasounds and I remember when we went and saw the ultrasounds um I remember looking at the screen and feeling like we were sort of someplace we didn't belong like we were on sacred ground um mm -hmm. we're looking into some place that there's something magical happening and, and we sort of don't belong there but we're we do um and there's, there's times, there's those moments when you're flying and or diving that to me, those feel like sacred spaces in, the, in a similar kind of way that what an opportunity to be able to look in, but we need to respect um, the beauty of it um, and, and the opportunity and the privilege we have to be able to take part in it uh, and be good stewards of that as well. I love what you shared there because so often when I'm flying, the thought comes, I can't believe that I get to do this. You know, it's something that I've wanted to do my entire life. And, you know, just recently have been able to live that dream. 
but that's a very frequent thought for me is I, I can't believe I get to do this. And, um, you know, I've had the privilege of flying across the country. I've flown the entire Gulf coast up and down the Pacific coast. And it, there's not a, even a better place for me. It's just all such a, a miracle when I get to do it. And I love that when I get to share that with other people, it's just this really powerful feeling to be able to take something that I love, that I enjoy, that brings me such joy, and then see that affect someone else, like what you're describing. Um, you're using your flying for some really great causes. I know you and I both fly for Angel Flight West. You mentioned Wright Flight. You also fly with the Civil Air Patrol. Um, and you had a really, I think, powerful experience on an Angel Flight that I would love for you to, to be able to share. Yeah, so this was um, this was my first actual angel flight mission, and sort of didn't know what to expect, but I just said, okay, let's go. Uh, and I flew up um, and picked up this gal, um, helped her get situated in the plane, and we took off. and And we we sort of had to move because we had a front rolling in from the west, and we were headed east, and um, so I wanted to get out in front of it. Um, and as we're flying, she started. I didn't really prompt her, but she started telling me her story and she'd been, um, getting treatment for six months and been away from her family for six months, uh, husband and daughter and, um, and hadn't seen them. Uh, and she was just sitting there talking about how excited she was to get home to see them and, and different things. I remember, um, landing and pulling up to the FBO and, and helping her get out, and then we walked in, and, and she she was she was trying to pull her own suitcase, and uh, she let go of that when she saw her husband. I was able to grab it and follow up, but um, just seeing the joy in their faces as they got to connect, and um, so many layers to that, right? Just they got to reconnect as husband and wife, and and see each other, but um, just reconnecting, going through the struggle of, uh, of her treatment and, and all of those things as well. And, um, just really amazing, um, to see that and to what a privilege to be able to be a small part of supporting and, uh, and helping that happen. You know, it uh, brings back memories of the, the flights that I've been able to do and, whether it's reuniting a family like that uh, really doesn't matter the situation. It, it again is just one of those moments where for me, that was, that was the most addicting drug that I could have been given as a pilot was, wow, I just got to be a tool in the hands of God to help someone else feel joy, receive health and healing to be able to reunite with their family you know, whatever it was, um, what a privilege to be able to serve in that way. Um, how, um, how have your kids responded as you've shared with them some of these, this charity flying that you're doing? Um, sort of a variety of things. I think one of the core is it sets sort of a visionary tone of what we, why we're here. Um, that, that we're here for a purpose that's beyond us. Um, it's, it's really easy, especially for kids to, uh, but all of us really to get locked in a very egocentric, the world is about me. Um, how do I feel? What do I want? And um, to look out and say, I'm going to do the right, th I'm going to do this because it's the right thing. Um, regardless of whether, whether I feel, think I feel good about it or different things is, um, it's pretty amazing. It's what, what's really interesting is to start to see, um, how you end, how your feelings of feeling good about it come along with it. And so when we set aside making ourselves first, I remember all the feelings of inadequacy to, to fly with, um, angel flight or mm -hmm. different things of going, I don't know that I'm that good of a pilot or that, um, I mean, I'm scared. What if I say the wrong thing? What if I, this, and all those things were just egocentric. They were, they made it about me and making it about me would have withheld being able to serve someone. And, um, and as I stepped out in faith and said, okay, I'm going to do this, um, be able to have, I was able to have an impact on, on the people I've been able to fly. 
but they've had as much or more of an impact on me. I'm not sure who really got the most out of it. I feel I feel guilty sometimes, like but being able to share that with my kids and set a vision for um, for what it means to be able to do things in a way that make an impact on other people, that the world doesn't just revolve around us, and that doing that also enhances who we are as people. Um, I think that's been a huge value for me. Now, you grew up seeing that model, right? You grew up as an army brat. And so I don't know if it was your dad or your mom that was serving or maybe both of them, but you got to see someone giving their life uh, in the service of their country. How do you think that influenced who you've become? So credit, it was my dad who served a career in the Army and then retired there and went and taught in inner city high schools. Um, oh, wow. And then um, my mom served as a stay-at-home mom, which is a job, a very difficult job in and of itself. Um, and and her service there and then giving in the community and very active in the church growing up. Um, but it didn't just start there. It started with my mom's parents and my dad's parents and, and seeing their legacy that they've, they built and they passed down of, of really serving a world bigger than yourself. Um, that's, that's set a standard um, to me of what that can look like and really just sort of created an, a, an environment where that's sort of the expected norm is that, that it doesn't matter what you have when you're, when you don't have much at all, you still, try to find ways to serve others. And when you have a lot, you find ways to serve and give back to others. And it, it's, it's not really contingent on how much you think you have or don't have. It's you always have something you can give back and serve with others. Uh, James, you ended up becoming an entrepreneur, but that's not where you started. You were studying to be a pastor. Tell me what changed. How did you go from... I'm on this path to becoming a pastor to I'm starting this company and I'm going to be an entrepreneur. Um, yeah. Life is what happens with you, to you while you're making busy, making other plans. <laughs> um, so I really felt the call to go be a pastor and my wife got deathly sick and um, where I was at going to college, mm. uh, the doctor said, if you stay here, she's going to die. Um, and so I had to make a choice and, you know, we talked about purpose and, priorities and my number one priority is God and my number two is my wife. Um, and so I looked at it and said, that's above vocation. And um, so just really at that point, while I felt emotions about it and didn't love all those emotions, it was, it was a very simple decision. Of, this is, I need to drop out. Um, so I dropped out of college and um, went and started working in IT doing computer stuff for different people and um, really took the drive I had to learn and grow and serve and make an impact and make a difference in people's lives. Um, and that sort of moved me through a career working for other people in IT. Um, and I really stumbled. I was, was more of an accidental entrepreneur thing. I stumbled across people that said, hey, can you help us independently? And so I did. And then they sort of collectively came to me and said, we want more of your attention. Can you do some consulting engagement with us? And so I started a business and my wife and I talked and prayed about it and ended up launching a business back in 2005, I think. Um, went full time and really kind of looked back. And now we have a team and um, more than most days now, my team says, Hey, James, we don't want you touching the technical things. We want you just leading the business. Um, so <laughs> that's another amazing privilege is to be able to invest in and mentor other people um, and build them up as leaders and build them up as capable people. Um, personally, professionally, um, be able to serve our clients well. Um, so it, I thought it was just more of a, career path thing. And I've found it's really been a part of, uh, a part of how I give back, uh, into the world, both to our clients and to our team members. James, I love the clarity that you have on your purpose and the order 
of those priorities. How did you develop that? Because I know a lot of successful men and women who struggle identifying what their purpose is. Uh, a lot of friction, a lot of grinding, uh, not quite yelling <laughs> externally, but internally. Um, I mean, the simple answer is for me, I opened up the Bible and looked at it and said, what, what, what comes first, what comes second. Um, but even that can get a little confusing. And so it was really just staring at and going, I've got to have a framework in which I can make decisions and decide priorities. And um, so sought counsel um, from others and, and sat and read in the Bible and said, okay, what, how do I rank these things? How do I prioritize things? And, um, and, and really develop that framework to create that clarity. Um, yeah. And that's in our business. One of the things I do, one of the key values I bring is create simplicity in complex environments. And um, so you take these complex things and you, you go, no, Hey, the, the order of operations and the, the, the priorities here are this, and that's, that's how we order this. And that's how we make decisions. And, um, and that's how we rank what we should and shouldn't do. Um, so I think that's, whether it's a gift or whatever it is, that's, that's something that I've learned to do quite well. Um, and, yeah, so it's been that kind of an opportunity to do that. That's incredible. So with everything that you have going on, business, kids, grandkids, diving, flying, how do you keep priority number two in line? How do you make sure that you're giving enough time for your wife? Because I'm going to be honest here. That is something where... Uh, I feel like our priorities are very well aligned. And then sometimes I look at my calendar and I wonder if I'm actually acting in that way. So how do you accomplish that? Or is this something that you also struggle with? I think anybody who says they don't struggle with it is either lying externally or to themselves. Um, <laughs> one of the, one of the first things that hits me is that there's this fallacy that you can actually ever live in perfect balance. Um, if you think of time, there's no such thing as the present. If you've ever heard of that, everything is the past or the future. Um, by the time we say it's present, it's past. And, and balance is this kind of thing. And we know this in an airplane, right? Where we talk about straight and level flight. It never actually sort of, nothing's ever, the minute it's actually in balance, it's not, right? And so it's, it's, it's slight corrections all the time. And uh, we do that driving, we do it you know, driving, all that kind of stuff. And, um, there's times where the business or the family or I need time away to go just sort of reflect. Um, and that creates imbalance in my relationship with my wife. And there's other times where we need to spend time together in a way that, that causes imbalance in the business or something else. And so um, once we realize that we don't have to keep everything perfectly in balance, but if it's, it's more about an ecosystem that sits in balance through seasons, um, that starts to give us permission to be out of balance at given times, but to have language around articulating that. Um, and then it's, for my wife and I, it's been really setting a vision for what that looks like and creating, um, having common values and then having conversations about saying, hey, we want to do a push for the next three months in the business. And that really means that I'm not going to have as much time with the family as, as I normally would. And, and we're going to make a choice that that's okay, knowing that it's for a period of time. And we're going to cap that with this or do that. Um, or even in that, I'm going to make sure that two days a week I'm available for dinner or whatever that is. Um, so it's, it's having that common vision and shared goals and then being able to have sort of a language to articulate it. But for me, the key part was recognizing that you can't ever be perfectly fully in balance because the minute you are, you're not. Um, and and that, that permission was probably one of the biggest pieces for me. I love the interconnection between what you just described and how you approach risk, where you said you, you want a healthy relationship with risk. It sounds like a healthy relationship with balance, or at least the concept of balance is something that you've been able to 
develop or at least understand and be able to apply in some really powerful ways. Um, you also said something that about simplicity within the complexity. Um, how do you, and we're gonna back up a little bit maybe to when you had teenage daughters. I have some teenage daughters now. Um, how do you create simplicity within the complexity with teenage daughters, James? <laughs> still have two. I have a 14 and a 16 year old, which are the youngest. Um, still trying to figure that one out. Um, Cause the minute you- <laughs> I was hope I was hoping you had the key to success. Um, the minute you think you have it figured out, um, the the next one throws a loop, throws you for a loop. Um, so, um, a, a piece of the simplicity is if you've ever seen uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, have, have you ever seen that? Or okay. I have, yeah. And that that kind of a tool of, or or if you think about laws of primacy. Um, is if somebody's in a fight or flight mode, then they're they're going to react a certain way um, because they think it's life or death. Um, and I've had this in diving I've had times where my body starts to panic in, in something and being mm -hmm. able to, because you flip into that fight or flight mode. And so being able to assess and look at the situation and say, am I really about to die? Or do I just feel like I might be about to die? Um, and for me, every situation I've had today has been, I feel like it. And if I go into that feeling and let it cascade, it, it could kill me, uh, whether that's flying or diving mm -hmm. or life. Um, and so what I've tried to learn is how do you let yourself experience that thing, but then mentally separate and be able to process it differently. Um, and, and not go into that panic response, which is usually the cascade of the panic response is usually the thing that creates the issue. So similar with our daughters is, um, is we try to look and say, okay, what are we really, when, when we're dealing with something, some kind of drama or thing that's happening is the question of what are we really dealing with? Um, trying to figure out, is this, are they doing this because they feel insecure? Or are they doing this because... You know, they're, they're yelling about or they're upset about um, this this shirt isn't clean or whatever it is. And the question is, is that really what's going on? And so from that from that hierarchy of needs is, do they feel like they're about to die? Do they feel like, are, whether right or wrong, are they in sort of that ultimate panic mode? Um, and then we sort of walk through that and look and go, okay, what, what are we really dealing with? And, and we're usually dealing with it on multiple layers. And we realize that if we're in panic mode, if we're dealing with something that induces panic, all these other layers can't be addressed. Um, and we have sort of a saying in our house that we don't negotiate with terrorists. Um, and <laughs> we started that when the kids were little, right? When they hit the terrible twos and they're, they're really terrorists of sorts. Um, then we sit there and we say, hey, when they are in that terror mode, there's no negotiation. The only the only event is to slow down or to get control of the of the terror mode, because we can't sit there and go, what are you thinking? Why are you feeling this at that moment? They don't even have the words it to. Um, teenagers, in some ways, are slightly more grown up versions of two year olds. Um, <laughs> some days, maybe less grown up, um, but and, and adults, we can be that way. So because um, we'll have some of that conversation in our own life of I'm not going to go going to negotiate with myself when I'm being in a terror mode. Um, and so when that's happening, the first thing is to calm the situation down to a point that now we can start to actually look at it, walk through it, understand it and, and connect with it. And so separating, getting the, the crisis under control from the causation and the feelings and the implied meanings and other things uh, for us has at least been a really good start. I'm sure that it's a uh, work in progress as, as you said, as soon as you think you've got them figured out, they change. <laughs> so, and I have found any way that most of the time it's, I'm trying to figure myself out at the same time as I'm trying to figure them out. So it's not so much figuring them out, it's figuring me out so I know how to show up as the right version of me in order to be the person that they need in that moment. And that's a, that's a 
big challenge and it seems to i change every day too so figuring myself out is as much of a challenge as it is figuring out the teenage daughters yeah it's, it's uh, constantly James developing my, for sure yeah my dad uh, always used to tell me alan remember the little things and for my dad the little things were the most important things what are some of the little things that you consider most important whether it's in diving and flying within your family in your relationship with god what are those little things for you that are the most important it's interesting that you say that because in some ways the little things are actually the really big, big things um for me a few of the little things are just showing up um some days that's about all you can do um i've been working on my fitness and some days it's all to, the 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 thing is that you showed up it's it's not glorious it's just showing up um and um i guess another part for me when it comes back to that purpose is the the little thing which is a big thing is just constantly going back to center to staying making sure i'm staying centered on on what my priorities are um and so it's it's just that constant prompt of like where are we and where should we be um where am I, where should I be as far as just awareness and, and what my focus is. Um, and then creating that clarity um, and then staying, um, staying on that. Um, in growing up, I heard a really good quote that helps me with that. It's never doubt in the dark what God has shown you in the light. And so it's, I, I really reflect on that when I'm in a chaotic event is I, I go back to core foundational training um and 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 lay that back in whether it's the darkness of a teenager with a mood swing issue or you know some kind of an event in a plane that's scary or diving or in your marriage or whatever it's it's going back to sort of you you, you sort of choose to have these core truths and then you you just continuously go back and center on those core truths um, and uh and and that helps you avoid sort of that cascade of emotional event where you start to go into the panic response where you can create your own cascade James, I love that i I feel like you've shared so much wisdom um during this hour. It's been fantastic. Uh, thank you for being willing to share some of your time with me today on the Plain Success Podcast. It's been a pleasure. If any of our guests want to get in touch with you, if they need IT services, uh, or maybe they want to, I have on my vision board to uh, get certified to scuba dive. So I know I'm going to be, I'll be looking you up for that. And then <laughs> hopefully in the near future, uh, how do people reach out to you? Um Easiest is usually email. It's james at jnrnet.com. Um, but I'm also on Facebook, Facebook and LinkedIn as James Riley. Um, and you'll see, I think on Facebook, you'll see a, a photo of me uh, in scuba gear. And I think on LinkedIn, there's a photo of a stingray up there on my cover page. So uh, definitely diving, <laughs> diving has a play in it. And if you flip through photos, I'm sure you'll see some photos from the air. But like you said, it's not the same. You got to go fly. Absolutely. James, thanks again for your time today. Thank you.